Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to do something a little different. Uh, all the other videos have been me talking just off the top of my head. But several people have asked in comments about what inspirations I have for game design. And if any of those inspirations have come not from games or books or movies, but just like everyday activities. And I realized not only do I have just such an inspiration, but I've actually talked about this professionally twice, once to the area design group I had at Carbine, and then again just a couple years ago to uh, the team on Outer Worlds 2. So I wanted to talk to you today about what would be called the top 10 area design rules, or what I instead called everything I know about RPGs I learned at Disneyland. So this could be a little long. Um, it's kind of area design 101. And if you just want to watch real quick and walk away, zones should be simple and fun. Players should look forward to experiencing them. And they should feel worthwhile to play through and to support the story. There, you're done. But now I want to talk about how this is really relevant to or related to theme park design. So first, a little background experience or background um, on this. I lived in Southern California for a little over 33 years. And for the first 15 years, I really never went to Disneyland. I would go if a relative was visiting or if friends really wanted to go. I'm like, okay, I'll go. But I found it, not only was it expensive, but I found it to be crazy crowded. And not just tons of people everywhere, which kind of makes me go, eh. But huge lines for everything I wanted to do. It was just hard to have fun there. Well, two things changed in the mid-2000s. One, I started hanging out with a group of people who loved going there and were really good at going there. They knew everything about the park. They knew the best days of the week to go, the best times of a particular month to go, what to do when you got there, like what rides were tended to be empty in the morning, like Splash Mountain. But then later on in the day when it was warm, don't go to Splash Mountain, you know, go see one of the shows, the, the live shows. And once you go to Disneyland with somebody who really knows what they're doing, it's a completely different park. Um, the other reason uh, things changed for me is in the mid-2000s, I was dating a theme park designer, well, an architect who happened to be doing a theme park in South Korea. What was interesting about this theme park, it, it was based on natural disasters like earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes. I mean, fun, right? But it was supposed to be educational and fun. Uh, the ride I designed was a hurricane simulator. And it was basically one of those swing rides that you get up and it spins you around. But it, there were uh, misters and um, flashing strobe lights and <laughs> a fog generator. So it felt really cool as it started and everything clouded over. It felt like you were in the eye of the storm, which I think was the name of the ride. Um, when I tell that to people now, they're like, well, that sounds pretty basic. And I'm like, well, you want to know the most basic ride there is? It's just a, something, an off-the-shelf thing that takes you through a bunch of window-dressed sets. I just described Pirates of the Caribbean, which is the most popular ride in Disneyland. So there's a there's a, a, a room for basic. Anyway, Disneyland, the people who make these rides are called Imagineers. And they work not only on the rides, but the spaces between the rides. They spend as much time on what you walk past versus what you ride. And I think this is really interesting because they want people to enjoy the park and come back frequently and feel like that experience was worth that money that you spent. So that was their goal. And that really aligns with game design goals. In fact, um, the Disney Imagineers, uh, the head of that was a guy named Marty Sklar. And he had 10 basic Disney design rules. And I had seen a talk of his, which is where I made this talk. And I gave this talk as early as 2010, I think. But in 2015, Marty Sklar's rules came out in book form called One Little Spark. I'll try to remember to put a link down below. It's a really good book. You should read it. But I realized that his design rules for Disneyland were perfect design rules for making games. So I'm going to go through them now. Uh, there's 10 of them. I'll try to go through it quickly, but this is probably going to be long. Okay, rule one is know your audience. What Marty Sklar said was that means don't bore people, don't talk down to them, and don't lose them by assuming they know what you know. 
And so this immediately translated into rules for RPG designers, which is if you put in a bunch of quests, vary them up. Nobody wants to do a bunch of escort quests in a row. No one wants to do a bunch of combat quests in a row. No one wants to do a bunch of talking to NPCs in a row. Speaking of talking to NPCs, don't have lore bombs. Don't have a dialogue that you get trapped in or a cinematic that you can't skip that you put in solely to just throw tons of information at the player. And he's like, oh, God, I'm in a, I'm in a monologue. Similarly, and this is a rule I had starting all the way back in Fallout, was don't put in cultural references and be very careful with your humor. And the rule for those two things is if you put them in, and why you feel like you have to put in a cultural reference, I don't know, but for humor especially, is don't put in something so that if, that people realize there's a reference or some humor being made and they don't get it and then they feel like they're not part of it. So always put in something that's funny on its surface, but then if you understand it's making a reference or it's it's a joke at a different level, it's great for the player to go, oh, I get what he's really saying. But player, players who don't get that should still think it's a funny thing. The second rule that Marty Sklar had for the Imagineers was wear your guest shoes. And what he meant by that was he required his designers and his staff, and he, and he um, suggested even the board members at Disney that they visit Disneyland as visitors. And what that meant was they didn't get parking permits or passes. They had to experience as a visitor did. Drive up, find parking, take the monorail over, get a ticket, stand in line to get a ticket, go in, stand in lines for, for rides. And the reason this is important was you have to know what they're seeing. For a, a, a game developer, what this means is you have to play your game, and you have to play your game a lot, a lot, a lot before it ships. Not just the own the own areas you're working on, but everybody's areas. Play with different items, play in different zones, talk to different characters, play different builds. And most important of all, don't use cheats. Because once you use a cheat, there's no guarantee the game is going to work. For you the way it's going to work for someone who's playing it normally um, rule three was organize the flow of people and ideas and what marty sklar meant for that in disneyland was use good storytelling techniques and remember that stories aren't lectures there's a lot of ways of telling story for rpg design what that means is i already talked about no lore bombs but it also means that your story should be very clear and have very clear steps especially the main story arc. You can fill things in in side quests, but your main story should be very clear. People should always know what's happening in the story and what they do to affect the story. That should be very obvious. And if it isn't, you're doing something wrong. The fourth one, the fourth Marty Sklar role was he called it create a come to me. Um, a come to me is a very large structure in the world that you can see from many places you are. The examples for Disneyland was the castle. When you first walk in, you see it all the way at the end of Main Street. You can often see the minarets and stuff from different parts of the of the of Disneyland itself. The Epcot Dome in Disney World serves that purpose as well. It has multiple purposes. One is to lead visitors from one area to another by creating what what are like visual magnets. Another thing is to give visitors rewards for when they arrive. There's often something to do when you arrive at these large structures. Interestingly. Walt Disney himself called those objects weenies. And he tells a story about <clears throat> when his dog would go off, his mom would um, tell him to go bring the dog back by using a frankfurter to lure it back. Funny enough, and totally true, I had a beagle when I was very little, maybe four or five years old, who would always escape. And my mom and I would go out with a raw hot dog to try to get the beagle to come over to us so we could bring it home. So I never realized I shared that in common with Walt Disney, but I think that's funny. In RPGs, though, we don't call them weenies or come-to-me's. We call them POIs, which is short for point of interest. And a point of interest could be anything. It could be a huge tree that you can see. It could be a mountain. It could be a castle. It could be anything huge that you can see from lots of different places in a zone. And then once you put in a POI, there should be reasons to go to it. Maybe it's where you turn in quests and get new ones. Maybe it's in an entrance to a cave or a dungeon. Maybe there's just a reward for going there. Maybe just going there um, creates a point on your map that you can fast travel to. All of these are good, and those, sh those should all be part of your POI. Um, I used to talk about um, Ghost of Tsushima. did a really good job at creating POIs. So if you haven't played that game, it's a really good game to play 
and see how they draw people in visually to going when they're going to different places. Similar to that, you should the rule five is to communicate with visual visual literacy. And what that means is there's a lot of ways of telling story non-verbally. So it's not just your narrative designers who should be telling your stories. You should your area and level designers should be making things with using color. I'm colorblind, but color is important. Shape, form, texture, just all kinds of ways you can create a zone to tell a story. For an RPG designer, it means you have to use your art very thoughtfully when you're putting together a zone. The props that exist aren't just there to dress up the zone. They should be telling a story. So if the player visits a zone, which was the site of an old battlefield, there should be skeletons and old rusty armor and weapons lying around. You should look at it and go, something happened here. I think whenever I talk about this, I think Fallout 3 just did a masterful job of this. There were so many places you could go in that game where when you'd enter a room or a small new subzone, you'd look and go, I know exactly what happened here. Whether it was two skeletons holding hands in a bed or you find an area where it has a ghoul and there's plungers everywhere and notes about somebody slowly falling into radiation-induced madness trying to create Radex and then somehow getting obsessed with plungers. You can just tell when you walk in, like, something bad happened here. The sixth rule was to avoid overload. And this is what I just said means you might want to do too much in an area. You will put too many objects. You'll put too many steps in your story. Your quest will have too many steps. What Marty Sklar would say is don't force people to swallow more than they can digest. Let them have some guidance and they will go through your area on their own and they will take it in at the rate they're comfortable with. For us, that means, first of all, this is the KISS rule. Keep it simple, stupid. Simple story, simple quests. Um, and by that, one thing I used to tell people is try to avoid quest objects. Like if you have a quest that says, can you take this to Bob? He's in this other zone. Well, first of all, that's a new object you have to pick up. Maybe your inventory is full and you can't pick it up. Or maybe you pick it up and now you go sell it somewhere or you drop it. So now you have to make all this special code for hero quest objects and they can't be sold and they can't be dropped and they don't count for encumbrance. And well, it'd be better if you just said, hey, um, Bob, here's, here's a code phrase I want you to tell Bob and then I'll be able to log on to this terminal and access this data. And then you can go, okay. And then when you get to Bob, you're like, hey, Bob, Mary said code phrase, boom. If you do have an object, just make it a virtual object. Say, hey, I want you to take this to, to Bob. And you're like, okay, we'll do. And it doesn't actually appear in your inventory. That's better than having a new quest object with a lot of rules around it. Similarly, if you have a lot of lore to tell, rather than have the player be forced through a cinematic or, a, or a dialogue, put it in a book or a note or a computer terminal and let them look at it when they want at, and read it at the rate they want. Similarly to this, a Marty Scar would say, only tell one story at a time. So if you have a lot of information, break it down into sub-stories because people will only take in as much as they want. For us as quest and, and, and zone designers, what this means is don't mix a bunch of story elements into one quest. Break it into multiple quests. Uh, sometimes you don't even have to break it into quests. Something could be a, a subtask, which is kept on a task. It could be just an achievement that they do. But if you do break into subquests, connect them so people know they're part of a bigger thing. But tr don't try to do five major story advancements inside one quest. The eighth one was try to avoid contradiction. One thing that Marty Sklar thought that Disneyland had a huge competitive edge with is people recognize it. It, it, it is what it's called. It has an institutional identity. The public, when they're at Disneyland, they know they're there and they see things that differentiate it from other theme parks, whether it's characters, color schemes, whatever. For us, it means when you make your game, it should have a clear identity. When people see a screenshot or a cinematic that is not identified, they should immediately go, that's this game. I see a lot of games out there that like, I want to make a fantasy game. And it's so vanilla. It's like, this could be anything. I have to watch and wait for them to tell me what game I'm watching. Um, it also means that if you're working on a sequel, don't contradict everything in the first game. People love to say things like, oh yeah, I'm going to take this thing that we told them and it's going to turn out to be a lie. Or I'm going to turn it on its head. Do that too much and you will lose people. Um, similarly, if you have a zone story, make sure a story in a particular zone fits into the old, the world arc. Don't, if we're, you're making Arcanum and magic and tech contradicted, don't have a zone where they don't. That just doesn't make any sense. It just confuses people. Just 
keep things at the IP setting story level very clean and simple. The ninth rule is he caught it for every ounce of treatment, provide a ton of fun. Um, he meant this more as since Disneyland is a business, you want people to go there and not go to other theme parks, which means they should have lots of different things they can do there and enjoy themselves and maybe even spend more money. That's why Disneyland has kiosks with food and toys and shirts and there are shows you can go watch. If you don't want to go on a ride, you can sit in a nice little air conditioned room and watch a live show. Basically, keep your environment very rich and appealing to all kinds of sensory experiences. For us, that's great. You, you do the same thing. Now, that does mean you have to accept that some grind is inevitable. For some people, grind is combat. For other people, grind is questing. It's fine. Mix it up. Provide a lot of things for people to do. There can be dialogue quests and stealth quests and exploration quests and crafting quests. And quests where you're just look or looking to get items to customize you or your companions because you're tired of the way you look or you're tired of the damage output you have. Great. There's also tons of feedback you can give people that they're doing good. That doesn't isn't just quest completion. There's getting achievements. There's uh, NPCs saying things to you. There's even different um, messages you can put on load screens. You know, it's like, hey, there's a murder spree in this town. It just pops up. And you're like, oh, that, yeah, that was me. And finally, the tenth one, Marty called "Keep It Up," but what he meant was. Don't underestimate cleanliness and routine maintenance and energy for part of live shows and people who present. When people come to your park, they expect it to be perfect, running and clean. And every show, the show at the end of the evening should be as energetic as the first show of the day because people will comment when they see something that isn't. They don't understand that, oh my God, this, this stage magician has done this act five times already. They want the sixth act to be as good as the first. For making a game, that means try to ship it with as few bugs as possible and good frame rate, all that stuff. I didn't always do that. I did get better at that over time, though. Very proud of Outer Worlds that shipped with very few bugs. Um, but that doesn't mean after it comes out, still patch for bugs and also patch for balance. Players will do things you don't expect and you're like, mm, I got to balance that. That means having good customer service and good form support. I know that's hard for indies, but... I think it's just something that's important to do. So anyway, those were Marty Sklar's 10 rules and my interpretation of what that means to do for game design. <sighs> Hope you like that very long monologue.